Hello everyone, good morning. Welcome to yet another wonderful edition of Ask the Pediatricians Live. My name is Mary Umo and I'll be moderating today's session. I am so glad to be here and I'm excited to learn about burns and prevention. I hope you two are. Please call your families and friends, share a video on your timeline on, and whatever group allows you to share it. Let them come out, join us and learn how we can prevent burns and peradventure if it happens, what we'll do to um, help um, solve the problem. So um, call, invite your families and friends, let them join us. We'll be starting shortly. Um, you know the rules, please. Uh, you will paste um, the comments um, in the comment section below. Um, kindly only post comments that are related to this um, topic. If you have any other topic outside um, Boston, please um, send it to our Facebook group page. Our moderators and professionals are on standby to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. I'm glad um, you can join us. Um, please um, invite family and friends to join us. Um, we'll give ourselves a little time and allow more people to join us before we start. Please remember to share our video. Thank you very much. Um, the drill goes thus. Um, the uh, doctor is going to uh, give us an overview mm -hmm. of the topic. And then we can start dropping our questions, after which he will um, attend to them as they come in. Thank you so much. Um, please stay, stay tuned.
Good morning once again, everyone. Good morning once again. Uh, my name is Mary Umo, moderating today's session of ATP Live. Um, I can see a few people have joined us. Good morning, Madam Sophia. Thank you for joining us. Um, so um, we'll be starting right away so we don't take much of your time. Um, like I said earlier, we'll be talking on bonds and preventions. Please share our video, invite friends and family, let them come and join us and learn what to do uh, with respect to bonds and its preventions. Kindly, kindly post questions and comments related to this topic that we are discussing today in the comment section below. If you have any other questions, please send it to our Facebook um, page. Our professionals and moderators will um, attend to them. Thank you so much for finding time to join us. Um, so um, we are going to introduce our speaker for today. Um, his name is Dr. Ayo Ayo Bami Aro Molate. He's a consultant, bonds and plastic surgeon. He's going to come and do justice to this all important topic. I know that we worry, we parents and caregivers worry a lot. We get confused, you know, when our children experience bonds and we wonder what to do. So please join us now. Um, let's welcome um, Dr. Yo. Dr. Yo, good morning. And we are glad to have you here. Thank you for finding time to join us. Yeah, good morning. And uh, thank you for having me on your your program even though i know that i'm part of the access pediatrician um <clears throat> right from the world go um i could see the relevance of the um the group and it has grown wider and bigger compared to what it started this is not the yeah. first uh, presentation I'm doing uh, because I remember that the, it wasn't a video. I think I prefer a video. The reason is because I'm a little busy. So immediately I'm done with you guys. I'm rushing to the theater. So I will welcome everybody and I'll say good morning in Nigeria. If you're anywhere outside the country, um, I don't know what time it will be where you are. So definitely in Nigeria, it's currently good morning and it's after 9, 9 a.m. here. So uh, once again, I'm Dr. Aaron Malati, um, also known as Dr. Laser. You can see the cap I'm wearing, just to make it more interesting for our parents, our brothers, our sisters, and everybody listening to us anywhere uh, in the world. I'm a plastic surgeon. Um, I'm also a bone surgeon. I had some training in bone, apart from my residency, uh, but also in St. Elizabeth Regional Bone Center. That's in Nebraska, Lincoln, USA. So <clears throat> I oftentimes also attend uh, the International Society for Bone Injuries. So I've also presented a paper uh, as a young um, a scholar uh, concerning uh, challenges of bone in developing countries. So all this just to preempt and tell everybody the little knowledge I have about uh, bone injury. Wow, doctor. So, Ooh, our speaker is loaded. <laughs> Mommies and daddies, caregivers, please come close, invite your friends. Let's hear from Dr. Ayo. So, Dr. Ayo, tell us more about burns and what can we do to um, prevent it? Well, I'll, I'll make it as simple as possible uh, when it comes to burn, burns and prevention. Well, uh, we all know as doctors that the best treatment is still prevention. Prevention, prevention, prevention. It is better for it not to happen than for it to happen. So that's our emphasis. Don't allow the bone injury to happen. That's our emphasis. Now, in simple word, we all we are all familiar with bone injury. Now, in simple word, in medical term, what bone simply means is. Um, in medicine, for those who are medical works, say it is either coagulative or liquefactive necrosis. Coagulative in the sense that just imagine um, a boiled egg. The egg initially is liquid, but when you boil the egg, it becomes solid. That's coagulative. Or liquefactive necrosis. Liquid. There are certain things when they cause like burn injury on the body that make it liquid. 
An example is an alkaline. A common one is the household jig, all those um, bleaching products that we use for our clothes. Majority of them are alkalines. Your regular car batteries are acids. So when acid is poured on the human body, it causes what we call coagulative necrosis. Necrosis simply means death. While liquefactive, meaning that it will melt. An example of this which I have given is all these our bleaching products that we use in the house, the jig in, in Nigeria, the parazones in Nigeria. So those kind of agents, corrosive agents, when poured on the body, will cause liquefaction, meaning it will make it liquid, necrosis. So now, what are the agents that can cause burn injury? Well, we tend to classify them um, based on the, the agents that is causing the injury. Uh, we will have what we call fire accidents, which could, as a result of gas explosion, industrial fire, uh, burning bush, bushes and things like that, you know, car accidents that will end up with fire accidents and things like that. So such people will have what we call a fire burn. You could also have acid burn, simple acid burn, where like in some parts of our world here or even in other clients, you have people when fighting pour acid or alkaline on each other. Those ones also could happen as an accident, maybe industrial accidents where acid is being managed in the lab and it's poured on your body that definitely will give an acid burn. It could also have what we call radiation burn. In radiation burn, this this has to be from special devices um, in some people working in a specific area. I'm not talking about the S3. S3 will not give you radiation burn. There are specific substances that can actually cause uh radiation burn so when we have such people definitely we want to take care of that now the other one is the lightning burn you could also have the lightning you know the that's why sometimes you see the house they tend to put a lightning conductor because sometimes when it is raining and there is a lot of storm and there is a spark and the lightning struck the house if the house is not well um that would have added it's not well hurt that could also cause some amount of injury on the body so basically we tend to refer to them as either thermal bond radiation bond uh the thermal bond example of it in the household include water um bond which we tend to know more notice more in children you know mothers when they leave their children they leave them the child is crawling and crawls to the uh, to the kitchen and pull the kettle of water or maybe a boiling uh, kettle is left somewhere and the child unaware of the danger goes to the kettle and pull the kettle and gets some water or water bond. This can also happen to, to adults. Now, when one have this injury, what should you do? Are you supposed to jump and say, yeah, you know? So the first step, which is, we always emphasize, is water. Water, water, water. Cold water. So whenever you have any injury, as a result of um, either fire burn, electrical burn. Uh, well, for electrical burn, basically, you will need to probably just uh, run away or be pulled away from the electrical injury. But if it is fire, Definitely, the next, the first thing you want to do is to get away from sight of danger. That's the first step. So, if it's a closed area, you want to quickly open the door and go out. Um, if it's an open area, you want to quickly fall, like some of the protocol that when you have a fire burn on your clothing, you want to fall on the ground and roll. The whole essence is one to pull or to cool, to put out the fire. That's the first step you want to do to put out the fire. Then the next thing you want to do is get something cold or something cool or clean water or cool water pour on the area please don't use anything like egg uh sometimes yes we say honey but the first step is that you have to first identify that okay will the substance you are using to put out the fire is it appropriate 
if it's our problem, please don't use don't use things like egg. You know, in this environment now, we've seen a lot of mothers they pour egg, they pour palm oil. Some people will use cow dung. Some people will use urine. No, if it's possible, just get clean water, pour it over the area. You know, pour as much as you can over the area in order to cool the body because one of the major challenges with bone injury is inflammation infection because you don't want all those things maybe you are able to control inflammation and infection definitely you'll be able to get away with a lot of things now for those who had fire accidents in an enclosed area i'm going to be specific it's always better to see the doctor if it's a small percentage bone area that is involved yes uh, there are some own care except you are not sure now, if it's your hand, areas like the hand, the perineum, the foot, the face, it is better you see a doctor and preferably a bone surgeon or someone who has training in bone, bone injury. I want to use some outlines so that um, I can carry everybody um, along and we can all be educated about it just give me some seconds so when there's a bone injury there are specific areas really if you have a child that is involved there are specific things you want to avoid one the first thing which which is what we have said is want to take the child away from the danger area you want to look at the environment where this burn injury occurred. If it is like a smoke, uh, a fire burn, maybe gas explosion, and it's an enclosed area, definitely that might have caused some degree of injury to the lungs. Now, the problem about that is that sometimes it takes time for the severity of that thing to become obvious. In some cases, if the child has inhaled some uh, suits, and uh, carbonaceous uh, uh, stuff or substance. In some cases, there could be some chemicals in the environment when the fire uh, occurred. Now, if the child has inhaled all those things, so if you have something like sulfur dioxide, you know, for those who who this uh, uh, chemistry, when it mixes with water, it becomes H2SO4. It becomes acid. Now, for the uh, burn injury that occur in a closure, maybe fire accident, and there's a lot of smoke, that is what we call carbon monoxide. The problem with the carbon monoxide is that it binds to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the substance that helps you to carry oxygen from one part of your body to the other. Now, the problem about it is that it, it has what we call high affinity. It means it has higher binding power over oxygen. So when we have issues like that, we want that child to have oxygen supplements. So it's not something as a mother you can treat in the house. No, no. So if you, even if it's an adult that is involved, don't just overlook it and say no, everything is all right. Uh, it's just it was just in the kitchen. We put out the fire. No, because that person can start having what we call respiratory um, problem after some hours because all those suits. The carbon monoxide will not encourage oxygen saturation. Even when you get to the hospital also, and you notice that the hospital don't have things like pulse oximeter. The pulse oximeter helps you to check the oxygen content of the blood. You Oftentimes what we emphasize is that such people should be given supplemental oxygen until like 24 hours. It's not compulsory all the time, but immediately the oxygen saturation is good enough then the person can be discontinued from oxygen. However, the carbon monoxide does not necessarily mean that it is all totally off from the blood. Now, so that's the emphasis on the airway. So if it's an enclosed area, because you can have also have some chemical bond, that when you have the chemical bond, what is in the hair, when the patients inhale it, it will also cause some acid bond. I've given an example of a, a, a uh, sulfur dioxide, you know, so when it is when sulfur is oxidized in air, it will give you sulfur uh, dioxide, and when that one uh, mixed with water, it will form an acid, which could be dangerous not only to the skin but also to the airway. 
Now, the other thing we want to find out is, as trained physicians, even though for mothers well, or for fathers at home or brothers or anybody that is around, if you look at your palm, look at this is my own palm now. My palm is assumed to represent 1% of my body surface area. So the whole body is assumed to be 100%. This does not apply in children. In children, we use another chart, which is totally different. Now, the worst of it all is that in children, the head is more important than the body. In adults, the body is more important than the head. Yes, in adults also, the head could be a very major factor in the sense that that's how you breathe. So the reason why it would be important in both child and adult is the fact that you breathe through the, through the nose and the nose is located in, on, the, on the head. But in children, the surface area is more on the head compared to the body. But on, in the adults, is the body compared to the head. So part of those things you want to establish is the percentage bond. Now when we say percentage bond, is, so we use rule of one or rule of one in adults. But in children, we have specific charts. But if you notice that in a child, the head is more involved. So part of it, it means that that, that child has what we call a major bond. So we physicians normally will say anything more than 10% in children is major. Not only that, that specific part of the body when it is born be automatically becomes a major bond. A good example is the hand. In children, you know the problem about the hand? When the hand is born and it is healing, the challenge you tend to have is that the hand tends to fuse together. It will start joining together. Now, that should not be managed by anybody. I will always advise that when they have a hand injury, because I've seen a lot of children, several years after, they now have what course acquired syndactyly. The hand will just be fused. Let me try and orientate my camera. The hand will be fused together like this. So the mother is now struggling, or sometimes it's in contracture. So the mother is now struggling. I say, doctor, my hand, my child's hand, God's bonds from years ago. Now the hand is fused together. So we have to do surgery. Now, that could be prevented. That's where prevention comes in. Prevented in the sense that when dressing is being done in that hand during the, process, during the healing process, the hand should have been splinted. There's what we call functioning position of the hand. We could splint the hand to avoid contraction. Now, if it is a major and, and the depth of injury is small, in some cases, we might need to do what we call a skin grafting before healing. Otherwise, if you allow it to heal, it will end up with a contracture. I'm giving too much detail, but that's more for medical people. Um, so we've talked about the airway. The airway is important if it's a, a closed injury, a, a closed door injury, like fire accident inside the kitchen, you know. And we've also emphasized that the head of the child is more important than the body compared to an adult whose body is larger than the head. Inhalational injury is dangerous. It should not be ignored. Um, whenever inhalational injury is sustained, it should be treated as emergency. No child should be kept at home after a closed door bone injury. It's worse off when it is a chemical injury, especially in this part of the world, where uh, acid bone, even in some hospitals, are not properly managed. They will start dressing. The first step is that they need to do a proper wash and, be, and use a litmus paper on the skin of that child to confirm if the acid, because you know the litmus paper, we have the, is it the pink and the red? So the acid will change one to a particular color, while the alkaline will change one to a particular color. That has to be tested on the skin of that child to be sure that the acid is already neutralized or the alkaline is already neutralized. Otherwise, the bone will continue for several days so causing what we call a superficial bone to become a deep bone. Now, so we'll talk about the percentage bone area. There are specific scale the pediatricians use to calculate bone, a bone surface area. Please, children's bone should be treated as very, very important. Now, I'll just quickly talk about severity of bone. I've talked about the part where we use percentage as um, classification for severity of bone. So when we have a child, after the physician have, or the doctors have calculated that this child has more than 10% bone, 
then it's referred to as a major bond. Please don't keep that child in the house. You are not a doctor. If you can't uh, take care of the child, go to the hospital. Let someone look at the child. Now, the other thing is that when you have a child, like part of the common thing we see around is the electrical board in children. You see children, when they are growing up, they play with cables in the house. That's a common accident. So the child will go there, start biting the cable and will sustain electrical bond. Please don't ignore because electrical bond is even worse. One, it can stop the hearts because it gives a negative electrical discharge on the heart. So the heart can stop. That's one. Now, when it is a lot, it can damage the kidney because there is what we call tubular necrosis. The unit of the kidney can be destroyed through electrical bone. Now, the other thing about the bone, uh, the electrical bone on the skin is that what is called an iceberg phenomenon. What you see outside for electrical bone, including adults, what you see outside is a pinch of what is going on inside. So sometimes what you are seeing outside is just a small percentage of what you are seeing inside. Yeah, my monitor is here. I'm taking my time. Have I spent a lot of time? You can go ahead, doctor. We still have a little more time. Go ahead, doctor. How many minutes do I have? Uh, you still have five minutes, doctor. So, when we start having um, a lot of um, questions and comments coming, then we can pause and take them. Okay, so I, I think I've, I've spoken majorly about uh, prevention. Prevention is one, don't allow it to happen in the first place. That's the first thing. Don't allow it to happen. So if you know you are cooking, make sure the children are kept out from the kitchen. If you have a child that is joining you in the kitchen, make sure you educate them. Make sure they are old enough to understand what you are doing. That's the other thing. We are, um, so if you have devices that have safety, use device that have safety, safety, uh, safety caution. Uh, keep some of those things at a very good height from their reach. Otherwise, oftentimes they, they will pull and, you know, you have hot water bun, oil bun. You see children, you are frying egg or you are frying dodo or plantain rather. And you quickly dash to the toilet. You didn't know that the child is around. The child will just dip his hand because we've seen children that they went to buy akara. That's the fried uh, beans. And they fell inside the oil. Oh, my goodness. Yes, that's in the past. Understand. So all those things, they are preventable. That's just it. They are preventable. They are preventable burn injury. But when they do happen, what should we do? Water. Clean cold water if it's possible. You can't get a cold water. Clean water. Take the child to the nearest hospital. Don't be a doctor. Don't be an hero. You are not trained to, to be one. Never commonize or trivialize injury that happen when you are in a closed environment, especially when it is fire and there's a lot of burning. Because oftentimes there is already injury to the lungs. To you, you don't see it, but to us, we see it. Because 24, 48 hours, the lung will swell, the air will become blocked. And before you know what is happening, the child will have difficulty in breathing. And the earlier the child is attended to, the better. If you know a child is involved in a major bone in a closed area, and you know your locality cannot handle things like that, because at, at some point in, in the recovery of the child, the child might need an ICU, might need to be on a ventilator to help the child to breathe. So if all those things are not, no matter, even though you have taken the child to an hospital, to the nearby hospital, they will still not be able to save the child. So in some cases, the child might need a ventilator. For the Western world, definitely all those things are readily, uh, readily available. Now, the other things will now depend on the physician. We are not supposed to be teaching physicians what to do, definitely. We are supposed to educate the public on what, uh, what to do. Now, if in, uh, inadvertently or somehow you manage to carelessly keep that child in the house, and the child has having fever, infection has set in. Infection has set in. So it means you still have to take the child to the hospital. In some cases, I do see patients after some years, they already have complications. 
and which is the reason why I emphasize the part of one, the hand, the hand of the child. Oftentimes, we tend to see that more. The hand will fuse syndactily. We have to do a surgery to free the hands. You know, in some places, it's, it's like this, you know, different shapes. In some cases, you see the child's hand like this because this part has been burnt. So the child's hand will contract this way. If this child, so we have like this claw hand. So we want to do surgical release uh, for those uh, kind of child. Now, during the recovery process also, it's also important that you should understand that that child will need more. Because in bone injury, the body actually burns more, more calorie. So the child will lose a lot of weight. The child will be swollen. Uh, some blood will be lost. So in some cases, the child might need to be transfused. The child needs to be given more proteinous diet, more calories. Uh, okay. The wound care has to be on top. You know, wound care is very, very important. Also in some cases, yeah. I've seen the child, I have to take out large percentage, about 40% uh, of the skin. I have to excise it and start grafting it little by little, little by little, in order to cover the area. It's expensive. So to manage bone is expensive. So it's better not to allow it to even happen in the, in the first place. So I Doctor, think, please, um, what do you mean by grafting? Sorry. Now, what so do you mean by grafting? We'll talk about now, when um, a percentage of the, when a, the skin is burnt, you could have what we call superficial and deep. Now, in superficial burn, the area will just be red. It could also blister. So we say first degree, second degree. Anything more than second degree becomes a big problem in the sense that they have the possibility of scarring. And when there's the possibility of scarring, it might need to be excised. If you don't excise it, it will form a contracture. It will, the, the hand will bend in order to reduce the wound that is created. So in such a case, when the wound is deep, we'll cut off that dead skin because if you don't also take off that dead skin, that will also uh, be a point of infection in the child. So we'll take out that skin. We'll go to an LD area of skin. You take it, the LD skin from there, we'll like slice it up. We have special device we use in doing that. In our environment, what is common is the ombi knife. We'll cut that skin off. Then we'll take it to that place, like stamp to the area and put like staple on it so that you have a cover. Now, in the Western world, there are things what we we'll call skin substitutes. We also have it here, but it's expensive. So for now, many people cannot afford it. There's what we we'll call skin substitutes, like the pig skin. There are some processed skin of pigs. There's what we we'll call aloe graft, processed skin of human. Oh that are used to cover the area temporarily, especially if the bone is extensive. So you look for an area, you, so you get other substances to cover temporarily. And, or, or temporarily, when the child is a little stable, you take the child back, then you look for skin in the good areas and used to cover the area little by little, little by little, little by little. So sometimes it takes months and even years for you to restore back that person to what, at least to a functional purpose, because the skin might not necessarily come back to what it used to be, but just to take the child back to a functional state so that it can be uh, independent of people around, you know? So like a child has a claw hand that cannot hold. So you need to release, do what called substitute release and, and grab. So those are the tiny, tiny details. So I think I think that that's enough information. I, I don't know what more to give to the public. It might be just too much. If I keep going. Thank you so much, Doctor. Mommies and daddies, ATPNs, please kindly drop your questions so um doctor can attend to them. We still have um about um 15 minutes. Um, so let's make uh, the best use of the time that we have left. So um, doctor has told us that the number one thing when it comes to bonds is 
prevention, prevention, <laughs> prevention. Yes, if it doesn't happen, then we will not be thinking of how to um, resolve the issue. So ATPs, caregivers, mommies and daddies, let's try and prevent burns um, happening to our children. I have learned so much today. You know, um, sometimes when we get, I get burnt occasionally in the kitchen and I wonder what to do, but I've learned that the first thing to do is put it under cold water, let it run for a while. So doctor, um, how long should I leave it under running water? Should I just put it maybe in a bucket? As, as, long, as long as you are comfortable with it. So oftentimes when you almost not feel any pain, because pain is a major trigger factor when it comes mm -hmm. to, it's all called bone cascade. Pain is a very big, if you can prevent pain, a lot of those things are, because the problem about pain is that the body will send in more blood supply to that area and there'll be more swelling. Mm -hmm. And with swelling, edema and healing, they are opposites of each other. Even though the body is trying to heal itself, but with edema, healing is slow. So with pain, if you cut off pain, edema will be less, healing will be faster. Now, the other part is that when you have done that, the next thing you want to do is to prevent infection. So if you're taking care of pain, you prevent infection, you are sure you are going to do well. So, but with edema, swelling will be more, scarring will be more. Wow. The bone will be longer, healing will be longer. <laughs> so, that's it. So, that's why a lot of patients, when we have a major bone, one of those things we try to do is to ensure that there is little pain. Those that will keep them in a place and will keep giving them an analgesic just to ensure that there's no pain. Because with the pain cascade, there'll be many others. Inflammation will be more. All those, uh, what we call tumor necrosis factor, interleukin 1, interleukin 6, they all rush to the area and they will cause more cascade. Wow. You know? And we all know all those uh, tumor necrosis factor is a bone factor. Bone in the sense that more things will be used in the body. Now, these things are the things that are supposed to help the body to recover, but you're using them to just burn away everything. So the body find it difficult to oh. to heal itself. Okay. Thank you for the clarification, doctor. So I I have another question. Now, if someone gets burnt in, in let's say a building and the person and the clothes are now stuck to the, the person's body, um, what's the best way to manage that? Should we treat it and we pour water? No. Very lovely question. Very, very lovely question. Mm -hmm. Now, the best bet is still, just like I've said, move away from the bone site. That's the first step. Okay. The next step, remove tight clothing. Because when you take out all the other parts, because usually the nylon, there is a, there is a nylon, the, the fabrics are usually nylon. Those ones, the reason is because those nylon, when they stick, they cause more bone because they keep burning. So what you want to do is that when you have done necessary thing, pouring cold water, keep pouring cold water on the area. Keep okay. pouring cold water. Then just gently separate. Preferably done by a doctor. Gently okay. separate. Because you don't want the skin to get more damage. Otherwise, if it's not coming out so easily, just leave it out. Let dressing continue. When immediately the, the area is cleaned. If they do one or two dressing on it, depending on what they are using to do the dressing, that uh, line linen will gradually come off. Oh. But don't rush to start peeling. No, don't rush. If you have like a scissors, pick off those other areas mildly. Keep pouring water on the on the person. Then those other small areas, because except they are lying on that they are stuck. You understand? If you just gradually separate, because you don't want the skin to get more damage. Because with more damage to the skin, the most carry. Okay, thank you, doctor. Um, you were saying something about the use of honey. Is it okay to use honey on, um, on you know, wounds yeah. from okay. birds? When you press it, yes, honey can be used, but that should be at the discretion of the doctor. Because okay. the truth of the matter is that now I won't want to give that kind of information to the public because our people are funny. Why do I say that? It's not all wound that we use dress uh, only for. If you have an okay. infection, infection, 
you want to find out the organism that is causing the infection. If there's a need for what we call the bride mate, you want to take out any dead tissue from there. It's not just for you to be plastering on your it. If there's a dead tissue there, if it is the one that will need surgical incision, like we normally call it, into the theater, take it out. Uh, dressing will never substitute surgical intervention. And surgical intervention okay. and dressing modality. So depending, so the person has to first be aware of what kind of injury this is. Is it superficial? Is it a deep bone? So it's only a trained surgeon or a trained uh, bone surgeon or a wound specialist or a doctor that has experience with bone injury that can differentiate because it's not all of them. Some of them you just need like a Vaseline on it. So if you have just like an erythema, but sometimes it's difficult in the sense that it's difficult to classify the patient because if the injury has occurred some hours and the patient is presenting maybe after 10 hours, there will be erythema everywhere, including on a deep layer. Though there are some that they will appear shard, there's all called shard, like they've been turned to like, you know, what hole is, you know, is looking shard. You say this one is looking shard. The one that tends to cause that more is electrical bone. So that one, the area will look so white. You know that this area is dead. However, it's difficult to differentiate because the surrounding also of the skin in that area will have some degree of bone injury also. So it's difficult for you to, to differentiate. So at that point in time, sometimes we'll do like a watchful waiting. It, not all the case, all the time. You need to be there, all technical things about it. You understand? So, however, if I know that this is a deep bone, I would rather go and exercise immediately because if I don't do that, infection will set in because it's like a dead skin on a living body. If you allow it, that very particular area, organism will grow and it will go inside the blood, into the system. Is there any question? Uh, doctor, we are yet to have um, questions from um, our parents and caregivers. Um, I think we'll just give a little more time and then we'll round up and go. We don't have any um, further questions. Um, so, Doctor, I would like you to explain a bit more about the lightning bonds. You know, when you said it, I was like, oh, really? So lightning can actually cause bonds. So if we see someone that we think was struck by lightning, we should yeah. just maybe take the person straight to the hospital. Could you throw more light on that, please? Well, for, for, for a lot of lightning uh, bone injury, they are usually superficial because um, okay. the lights sometimes grace, uh, they just grace over the body and goes on the floor because basically what the electrical stuff has done is, is looking for a way out of, the, uh, of, you know, jumping from one level, trying to go inside the earth. Well, it's so, looking for a pathway. Yeah, so if the body is not the conductor, it will just run through the body. But the challenge about that is that it could also damage some organs. It could stop the heart oh. during the process. It could damage the organ, it could stop. So if the resistance, if there's no place to discharge this and it stops on your body, sorry, it could be very dangerous. The, the, the fact is that the heart can stop during that period, momentarily. And if there's no intervention to reverse, the heart, uh, the person, the person can die. Well, it's not something we see regularly, but it's not a taste by moonlight. It does happen. I know in Africa <laughs> they say no, oh, why, yeah. it's not why, yeah. <laughs> that's why if you have all those tall buildings abroad, you see them, they will, they will um, put a lightning conductor. It's just to ensure that when the building is struck with lightning, because electrical discharge is discharge on the house, mm -hmm. it will find its way down, so I will say, the, the a building is at. They understand? So there are certain degree, because the building itself okay. have, have resistance. Like my office now, when I, when I buy any equipment from GE, they will insist that the resistance of the building should be less than four ohms. The ohms is the unit of okay. resistance. So they will say mm -hmm. it should be less than four ohms. So we'll do all the necessary wiring, then we'll send in a cable down into the heads and we'll check the resistance of the building. The only sense is that 
when there's an electrical discharge on the building, it doesn't get stuck on the electrical devices you are using at that point in time, and that okay. will destroy it. The same thing happens. So when the resistance is small, it just moves fast down into the earth. Thank you, doctor. So another thing I, I've learned today is, um, you know, what we do, I, I am also guilty of this, we plug our charger, chargers, our phone chargers, laptop chargers, we leave them switched on, and then we have little ones running around. Doctor yes. Lester has told us today that it is very dangerous because it can yes. cause a little electrocution, which can, um, you know, cause electric burns. So ATP and parents and caregivers, please, let us take note of that. Um, so um, we have not had any questions yet. I'm wondering if it's because of the um, different timing. Normally, ATP life starts around 10, so probably mommies and daddies did not note the time. But um, doctor, we are really, really glad. We are happy to have you here. I have learned so much today, and I'm going to go out and tell my families and friends. And ATPs out there, um, since we don't have any questions, um, we are going to ask doctor to just um, to a roundup for us um, before we go. Okay, so once we discuss about bone injury and prevention as it pertains to children, I try to focus more on children. I uh, emphasize that you could have acid bond or chemical bond. So it could be acid, it could be alkaline, you could have radiation bond, you could have thermal bond, which is the, a lot of times the own uh, water or fire and things like that. You could have electrical bond for our children, children biting cables. You know, this one could be minor. So for a child, when it is more than 10% of the body surface area, I also emphasize that the head of the child is more important than the body because the surface area of the head is bigger. In adults, it's the reverse. There are specific charts we use to calculate this. The pediatrician will know the London Brothers chart that they use in calculating the charts that you look and start calculating, okay, this is the percentage because that's determining how much fluid or restoration to be given. I've also said that if there's a fire accident in an enclosed area, the lungs will have been affected. So don't trivialize it. Know that the child needs uh, either hospital admission monitoring. And also emphasize that there's what called carbon monoxide that could have been exchanged during that period which will limit oxygen in binding to hemoglobin in the child. And that could be a problem. I also emphasize that the child could start having difficulty in breathing. Because what you realize initially, you've not seen the real thing. And for the electrical mm -hmm. bone outside, it's a, it's a pinch of what is going on inside. That's for the electrical bone. And we have decided prevention is more important than treatment. And in some cases, these children will need reconstruction if it's not properly done or managed. And they might need to see a plastic surgeon or a bone surgeon to correct some of the deformities. Any other? Thing? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yo. So, mommies and daddies, um, I hope we have learned a lot today. I have learned a lot. So, if your child maybe um, was caught in a fire in an enclosure and probably did not have any scars on the body, don't just assume that all is okay. Dr. Lesser has reminded us to, has emphasized that we should take the child to the hospital because the child may have inhaled toxic substances that could um, damage the child's lungs. Thank you so much, Dr. Yo. We're really, really glad you found time out of a very busy schedule to um, join us today and teach us more about burns and its prevention. We're very, very grateful. So ATPians, please, um, we are going to be ending the show. If you have any questions, kindly post it on the um, Facebook um, page. Our professionals and uh, moderators will attend to them. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have not downloaded the ATP mobile app, please do download it and use it and also um, uh, give us feedback. Thank you so much, Dr. Yo. Thank you, ATPians. God bless you. Have a great day. Bye. Lovely.
Thank you, Dr. Yo. Bye.